So we're welcoming back Brent Fullerton, our new regional manager from the Lauren Cook Company. Today is going to be our fan basics class. We have a few, actually it's kind of cool with our hybrid capabilities, we're going to remote into the factory. We're going to do some training live from Springfield, Missouri, which is kind of fun. And then short of that, Brent's going to entertain us with his experience in the industry, right Brent? And yeah. Make it a little fun. <laughs> Brent's been around the block. If you didn't attend Tuesday, which this is a basics class, if you're taking basics, you probably didn't need to attend Tuesday, but if you didn't, um, Brent's been in the industry for quite a long time, uh, 20 some odd years, uh, some as a consulting engineer, some as a regional manager for the Lauren Cook Company, some as the um, OEM restaurant specialist for the company, among other things. And so he is uh, here to bring us Fan Basics, his particular spin on it. So without further ado, and how are we doing? Uh, how are we doing? Uh, I forgot, Tamara. Uh, 14 remotely. Okay. I think we're doing pretty well. So uh, everybody, since you're all at home, put your uh, slippers up. <laughs> Enjoy watching the snow outside instead of in your car. And um, look forward to seeing you at the top of the break. Right. Take it away, Brent. All right. Well, as Tom mentioned, we're going to do a couple of different things in a couple of different ways today. One of which is work as David Letterman before he through the infinitely long beard and kind of got a little crazy. Live from Springfield, Missouri in our corporate headquarters in one of our training center rooms, we're gonna have Chris Curry, who is our national accounts manager, help out on this presentation. And we're gonna go through wheels and props. Now, one of the reasons we're gonna go through wheels and props is it's a basic introduction as we start to not only understand everything about a fan curve, but actually also where that performance comes from and how it varies. So those of you that are here, got an engineering gift pack. Those of you that are remote can download a PDF of our engineering cookbook or get with your friendly neighborhood airflow personnel and they can get you a copy of that. But it's everything in it going back to the basics of some of the characteristics that Chris is going to talk about here in just a minute using the wheel and prop wall. And also, you can download on your smart device an electronic version of that booklet and have that with you 24 hours, seven days a week. Without anything else, with the magic of camera, we're going to switch over to Springfield, Missouri, and Chris Curry. Um, Brent, would you mind stop sharing from your so, screen? Brent, thanks for the introduction. And uh, so like Brent said, this is uh, the wheel and prop wall. Actually, uh, what we're going to do is I actually had to divide this into two segments. So I've got the props right here, and we're going to go through them. But one of the key things that intimidates a lot of people when they get into this industry, uh, especially coming to Lauren Cook Company, is that they hear, well, Lauren Cook has 250 different products. Well, Calm down just a minute. Everything starts with the impeller, whether it's a prop or wheel. For example, here is several props right here on this wall, but behind me to my right, your left, is actually just two wall props right here. And we could actually take one prop, this prop, which is the A cast prop, and put it in the exact same housing up here, and it becomes a prop as well, and the E-prop. So they're interchangeable. So a lot of these props are interchangeable once you put them in housings. I know Brent's probably gonna show you a little bit later, but you take these same props that you see right here and put them in maybe a propeller roof uplast application. You know, it's the same characteristics, but just used in a different matter. Now, what are those characteristics? Well, all of these are technically called propeller axial fans. And what that means is that the air moves along the axis of the shaft, along the axis of the shaft. So we've got several different up here and I just wanna briefly go through them. And then we're gonna to get to a little bit uh, closer detail here in just a minute. But here are some stamp steel props, same as this. This one is actually probably used in a condenser that you're probably familiar with. 
This is a legacy prop, but we keep it up here to show you how the technology has changed from a simple curved uh, steel blade to more complex stamped here. Now, these have different pressure levels. Now, I always get a little concerned when I talk about pressure to uh, people. They want to know an exact number, okay? And that's kind of problematic. You know, when we talk about these are good against resistance, low resistance. Now, low resistance may be a quarter inch because these are actually designed to move a lot of volume, okay? A lot of volume. So a quarter inch of pressure against a lot of volume is not much. But when you get down to like 500 CFM or less, a quarter inch of pressure is a lot of pressure when it comes to propeller axial products. So again, these are stamped steel. I wanna move a little bit and show you. There's cast aluminum, there's extruded aluminum. And I wanna, I'll get a little bit up close and personal with those so you can see what I mean with extruded aluminum and cast aluminum blades here in just a moment. Now, I wanna focus a little bit more attention than probably you're expecting on these two props right here. Now these two props on your screen look very different. Okay, I've got a four blade versus a nine blade. Well, this kind of goes back to what I was saying about these casings over here is that you put the, you know, the, you can put different props in different casings to get different products. Here, we actually have two very different props that go in the same casing for the same product. This is an AI product if you're uh, uh, familiar with our nomenclature, but what we have here is we have a nine blade that is steeped pitched real steep at a 45 degree angle here we have a four blade pitched real shallow at five degree angles now why would you do that well you can get different flows at different pressure this is a very low flow low pressure application but as you begin to add pressure and need more flow you have to have the angle of attack get much steeper but also i want you to notice these hub diameters this is a very small diameter compared to this the reason being is there's a lot of force on these blades because you all actually have to continually to spin the prop higher and higher pressures or higher and higher speeds in order to overcome pressures. So again, this goes into those characteristics about the fan curve that Brent alluded to. You can get two different looking fan curves out of one product just on the way the blades are pitched, the length of the blade and so forth. Now, the length of the blade and hub also has to do with the stress on the blade. As we spin these faster and faster, there is more weight or load on the tips of the blades, and so there's more force. So we actually have to shorten the beam in order to maintain the structural integrity. So that's why you'll see different lengths of blades and different hub sizes when you're talking about propeller axial. Now, you can also, it's very hard to see on the screen, but this prop and this prop look identical probably to your screen, but this is pitched for one direction. This is pitched for a bi-directional flow. Now, that's based on the applications you need. You actually lose some flow uh, ability when you pitch the blades in the wrong direction, but that's compensated in a lot of the selection softwares out there. So again, these are propeller axial units. Again, they're designed to move air along the axis of airflow or along the axis of rotation of the prop. So it has used in a lot of straight line applications like wall props, but also propeller up blast fans on roofs and et cetera. But when you start getting into applications where you have more resistance in the system, like a ducted system, because these are typically used in non-ducted systems. But when you go to a ducted system, you're actually gonna to have to use a impeller. Now I'm gonna apologize, I'm gonna step off camera because I'm the cameraman today because my cameraman is actually taking care of his wife in the hospital. But we're gonna move the camera just briefly over to the wall prop, to the wheels here. So that's why we call this the propeller and wheel wall. We move to another section of the wall here and you can see a variety of wheels right here. Now. These all move air in and turn in a certain direction. And I'm gonna change the camera one more time to actually talk about and show you what I mean by that. So, but I wanna give you this overview. So I apologize, 
Got to step out of the frame because my control board is in another part of the room. Just bear with me, and I'm going to get to the camera here. And you should be able to see now a couple of blades. Now, what these blades are, are what I was talking about, about the cast aluminum blade right here. I talked about earlier, okay? Show you this shape. You can see the airfoil here. This is an extruded aluminum blade, and you can see the airfoil there as well. Notice it's straight, so it has one characteristic where the cast aluminum blade, while it has an airfoil, it has a little bit more three-dimensional curvature that you can see. Now, we moved on to the wheels. We're going to talk about these wheels right here first. These are uh, the centrifugal wheels that we commonly use in our spun aluminum products. They're also used in uh, square inline products as well. And I just want to show you. The main parts of the wheel are this. You have a hub. You got a picture in picture here, I'm sorry. You got a hub here. You got a back plate. It goes all the way across. The back plate connects to the hub, but also connects the blades to the back plate and hub because here's the fan shaft. Then this is called the wheel shroud. It helps direct the air into the wheel itself as the wheel turns. But notice this goes in, the air goes in, and then has to turn 90 degrees in the wheel, okay? That's something we're going to come back to. Now, these blade lengths actually dictate the flow, okay? Common misconception is that, you know, this is a pressure. This dictates the flow. The diameter is what dictates pressure when you're getting into uh, centrifugal wheels. The larger the diameter, the more capable it is of actually getting higher flows. So we at, or excuse me, higher pressures. So what we do is that these wheels, we will have a variety of blade heights to control the flow in order to change basically the shape of the fan curve later on. So you can see this is gonna, this blade is gonna move a lot more air than this blade versus this blade. So these are all we blades that go into a wheel like this, okay? Now, back here in your picture in picture, this is the wheel I was just showing you in the cutaway. Here's a wheel right here, and it's very hard to see, but there's actually rings in here, okay? The reason for that is those rings will actually take and actually support the wheel right here to actually the blades so they don't collapse under a lot of speed. That's done so you can get higher flows, higher pressure at certain points. But again, we're going to control that a lot of times with the blades. That is actually going to change that fan curve that Brent's going to show you a little bit later. Now, we're going to move on, and I'm going to show you these wheels right here. Okay, These are fully welded wheels that are typically used in blowers and in industrial applications and so forth. Now, I have a flat blade wheel here, and I have an airfoil wheel here. So what do I mean by a flat blade versus an airfoil wheel? Well, if you're there in person, Brent will say, hey, it's Chris. We got to keep it simple because, you know, he's kind of stupid. So, but this is what's called a flat blade wheel. This is the same blade that goes in basically this wheel. I have a cutaway for you to see of this wheel, very similar. Okay, you can see the profile of those blades are actually flat. This is what's called a flat blade wheel, used in a lot of applications. Now, when we go from a class one, and a class one wheel is defined by the outlet velocity and pressure that the blower is capable of. We're going to have to reinforce that blade in order to maintain its structural integrity. So, right here, what I'm showing you, as I'm showing you the thickness difference between a class one blade and a class two blade. You know, there's still a flat blade product, but we've almost doubled the thickness because obviously these are actually beams, cantilevered beams here, okay? 
put more straights. In this case, we've actually put a reinforcing gusset all the way around to actually divide the span, okay? But in certain wheels, that's cost prohibitive, so we actually will add additional thickness of the blade so the blade, so the wheel can turn faster. This is a class one, this is a class two, it's gonna turn faster. And then this is a class three wheel here, which you can see with all the gussets and structure in it, because now it's dividing the span in two. So this is a class three wheel here. This is a flat blade. Now I mentioned airfoil. So what I mean by airfoil? Well, pretty simple. If you look at this right now, this is an airfoil. This is an airfoil shape right here. You can see the cavity right here. It's different than from the flat blade. So which one is better to use? Well, that is a cost point. This wheel or wheels that use this actually are more efficient to use, okay? Now, when we talk about efficiency, what we're talking about is that because the airfoil creates a slightly better efficiency point inside the wheel to move the air because of the principles of the pressure airfoil, just like a plane uses this to generate lift, we use it to generate more pressure within the wheel to help move more air. Now, this is a class one blade. It's also a class two blade because we've also doubled the thickness just by wrapping the material around. I do want to point out though, you can see right here, while we just cut this shape out for a flat blade, we have to cut out a complex shape, form it and weld it in an airfoil. So there's a higher cost point right here, but being more efficient, it can pay for itself over time. That's probably more advanced than one of what uh, Airflow wants to get into with these classes because it's part, you're supposed to start at the basics, but just keep in mind that this can pay for itself. Now, again, class one and class two, it's double the material around it. Here's a class three again, class three wheel. If you notice, what we have is that we've broke, we've segmented the beam right here by this gusset so it can go to higher pressures again. Now, again, all these wheels there comes in and turns in a 90 degree to go out of the wheel. So that's why they're good in blowers and so forth, okay? Now, when you're dealing with, let's say, an inline application, okay? Inline applications, you have to have a lot of air around these wheels in order to get around. I'm gonna put this back up here so you can see what I'm talking about. So what I'm talking about is that the air comes in, has to turn 90, and then you have to have a great deal of space to allow that air to pass down through in an inline application. So, so the air comes in, turns, and you have to have all this space here. So traditional tubular uh, inline centrifugal fans, they were big. So. What was developed by this company is called a, a mixed flow wheel. This is the very first mixed flow wheel. Let me adjust the camera so you can see what I'm talking about. The very first mixed flow wheel was developed by the Lauren Cook Company, and it looks like this wheel right here. Okay. Now, the thing about it is why a mixed flow wheel? Well, what it does is The air comes in the wheel now. Instead of having roughly turn 90 degrees, it curves around so it's much more efficient in an inline application. Now, we just talked about how using a prop is good for an inline application because the air moves in an axial direction. Centrifugal wheels, keep in mind, all these centrifugal wheels, you're gonna use those for pressure when you have resistance in the system. <clears throat> Excuse me. Remember I was very reluctant earlier to talk about how you have a number to hang your hat on about, oh, a quarter inch of pressure or more is what you need to go to switch the wheels with. Okay, well, that may not be. You may wanna be a quarter inch of pressure if you're moving high velocity. Quarter inch of pressure at 500 CFM is a lot of resistance. You're gonna to have to go to 
some type of centrifugal wheel. That number is just relative based on the airflow. If you're doing a lot of moving air in an axial direction, you want a propeller axle fan. This wheel, okay, you have more pressure, you are going to be more efficient to moving air in an inline application because of the way the wheel is designed. So same concept, we have a wheel shroud here, we have blades, we have a hub, but the key is this dome here that allows the air to curve. Again, this is called a mixed flow because it is a hybrid of the propeller axial characteristics with the centrifugal wheel. Now, just like we had a flat blade wheel, okay, we have a somewhat flat blade mixed flow wheel. Look at the contour of that. That is to allow to get it efficiency in this application. This is an airfoil version over here, or an HP wheel. You can see kind of the airfoil, but this is actually what the airfoil looks like in a mixed flow. Notice the cord here and the cord here is a little different so that it can actually go into the wheel and keep that mixed flow characteristic. There's actually about three different pressure characteristics of this wheel. This is a QMX. This is a QMX HP, and then we have a QMX XP, which is a lot of wheel, a lot of blades in a short confined space, okay? Moving on. There's also specialty wheels we need to talk about that are also a type of centrifugal wheel. These are called radial blade wheels right here. They're kind of, I'm actually gonna apologize. Again, I don't have a cameraman to help me out here, but I'm gonna zoom in a little bit on that so you can see what I'm talking about. All right, so these wheels are designed to convey material, okay? They're gonna move air and material. So they have this radial design. This, is, this particular wheel is actually used for dust, uh, dust collection, take the same wheel and put a back plate on it. What it does it protects the back plate and more importantly, the shaft back here from long fibrous materials getting wrapped around it. So these are radial wheels in order to move material. There's also some specialty wheels here, this black wheel right here that's very hard to see. And that's done on purpose is that this is a forward curve wheel. Um, forward curve wheels, what they do is they don't, they don't do it, generate pressure. These are used in a lot of residential applications. A lot of people like them. Uh, I despise them because they scoop and throw air. They do not develop pressure. And probably the most kind thing I can say about a forward curve or squirrel cage wheel is that it is un unstable on all parts of the curve, okay? Uh, then there's also fiberglass. There's a lot of different resins out there now for a lot of fiberglass applications. Um, coating technologies in this has now gotten to the point where you probably don't even need fiberglass. So they're out there. Coating technologies have improved to the point where fiberglass no longer cost effective in order to do basically the same applications as that you're seeing with the centrifugal wheels. So, uh, Brent, I know you wanted me to talk for about 35 minutes and I talked for 24 minutes. So, you got the rest of this? No, you're not muted. Yeah, I'm back on. Chris, thank you very much. Uh, you did a great job, double, triple duty this morning. One man band doing everything. We appreciate it. So, uh, hey, Chris, nice to see you, man. Yeah. So, we're going to well, switch. You guys are safe in the weather up there. Thank you. Thank you. So, we're going to switch back over and we're going to go from there. All right, that. and you should be back in. So here's a- Before we hop in, Brent, I just, I yeah. just wanna say what, when I did, I did a fan training online at the start of COVID. And you know, that, that Cook catalog, not that anybody uses the catalog anymore, but that Cook catalog is pretty daunting as is any fan manufacturers. If you can just boil down the wheel first, it really saves a lot of time. So I think it's the way you guys started this presentation off is great. Um, start off with the wheel, then it just comes in a box and then it's 
Elder Direct Drive, and you're most of the way home. Great, outstanding, and that that was part of the plan. And I'm still getting that reverb again, but um, so hopefully that's not coming across remotely as much. But we're going to try to mess with this a little bit so the reverb's not quite as much. Okay, so yeah, there is a method to the madness of why we did some of the layout and the recap of the props. And I really appreciate how Chris jumped in and showed that remotely. Um, that's something that I used to try to take some of it on the road and it just became too cumbersome. And especially when we got the technology to do remote into the showroom, it just goes so much better that way. Okay, so from this standpoint, want you to have to spend a thousand dollars on check bag fees anymore uh well yeah and that was a low that was that was the lowest check bag <laughs> fee <laughs> okay so now that we've talked and given an overview of the wheels and the props we're going to go back into air air characteristics 101 and this is all going to be about building everything up to get to where we go to a fan curve from that standpoint Okay, so air measurement, density, and performance. It's, uh, it's off. It is off. It is completely muted. Speaker? It was. Yeah. It's muted. Wow. Okay, so yeah. <laughs> air measurement, density, and performance. I'm going to start with the analogy going back to a fluid in a fluid form that most folks are more familiar with than air, and that's water, okay? We've got several right around um, the good old uh, water towers. So feet, yes, I like the English. <laughs> I rebelled against learning the metric system like everybody in my generation, and we'll keep it in English units, but feet, the height of the water tower, Available pressure equals feet of head. Resistance in pipe equals feet of head. And flow in gallons per minute. You'll see very quickly why I make this analogy. Now, later on this morning, you're actually going to see an actual fan run and do a few things on that. But when we're testing a system, we're trying to obtain what the resistance is in the system it is. And so there's airflow measurements normally used with a pitot tube or a YouTube manometer or a couple other devices, digital. But the old adage was a YouTube manometer is kind of outlined on this. And the number of inches that it moved the fluid in that capillary tube referred to inches of pressure or also known as static pressure in inches of water gauge. So that's showing on that, and I used the little blower outline showing that, and you'll see some of that here in a little bit. So one of the things that always comes up is the volume is in cubic feet per minute. I actually had an undergraduate professor that deducted um, darn near a whole letter grade because I made the statement CFMs in my Southwest Missouri term, you cannot have a cubic foot per minute per second. You have a cubic foot per minute. So we'll get back to that and also reference when we talk about RPM, but we we'll go from there and the snow is kicking up. Okay, so you have a one foot by one foot by one foot cube. And I have a plexiglass one back in Springfield that I had made. If it's stationary, what is it? It's a cubic foot of air. If it moves, it is a CFM. Okay. Now, we talked a little bit more in depth about this in the advanced class, but I still want to touch on this briefly. So total pressure, static pressure, and velocity pressure. Okay, we're not going to get real deep into this because this is a basics class, but total pressure minus static pressure equals velocity pressure. Why do we talk about it? Well, we have to know what the flow is in a system. We know what a fan does, 
and I'll show you where we get the performance of the fan a little bit later. But we also have to know what the fan does in a system. A system has elbows, other devices, transitions, all sorts of things. There's something a total pressure probe and a static pressure probe. They are different in how they're used. And this is actually taken from one of our brochures that we utilized on Tuesday in our more advanced deal. But this is specifically, I want you familiar with all the terms and the handy dandy cookbook does have some of this outlined in that as well. Now, let's talk about air density. This is one of the things that can get a lot of folks in a lot of trouble very, very quickly. A standard air is referred to as air at zero feet elevation and 70 degrees. Now, if you're working on a project in Wisconsin, probably don't have much to worry about if you're a little bit off from standard air conditions. But what if you're working with a high temperature application, more of an industrial? What if you're working on a project in Denver that's the Mile High City? Anything along those lines, that affects the density of the air greatly, and that will also affect the performance of the fan. So that's why we bring some of this up and we go from there. First off is elevation. So right here, good old Milwaukee, 617 feet above elevation. Madison's 873, Chicago's 597, Green Bay's 581. Not a lot of variation, but there is some. And truth be told, while it will affect the performance, it's not gonna affect it greatly. But let's go to Denver, as I mentioned, 5,000 feet it will completely change the performance of the fan. Okay, temperature. Yeah, some people like it hot. This right here is an example of a high temperature blower. This blower had to A, be constructed out of stainless steel to withstand the temperature. It had to have specialty components added. Um, you'll see a little shaft slinger or bearing cooler but you'll also see different things that had to take into place, not only to withstand the actual temperature at the metal, but then the performance had to be sized and designed for the temperature, the elevation, and the air movement that was designed, as well as the pressure. So that all gets into the basics of, you gotta know where you gotta stop, to know how and where to start so that you don't get in trouble. Uh, I always use this, this is off of the engineering toolbox, um, but this shows air density and specific weight. So for those that like the visuals, you can go back and see that. And this is one of those things that really shows how that all comes into play, go from there. Now, of course, our software program, our software program will actually help on part of that and uh, does it automatically. I mentioned the engineering cookbook. There's an example of one of the pages. <clears throat> and then um, we'll go into some more of this here in just a little bit. But now we're going to jump off and take a sidestep here. And we're going to talk about AMCA. AMCA is headquartered down in Chicago, Illinois. And it's the Air Movement and Controls Association International. Now, why would I jump off of that? Well, first off, this is where you can go and find a certified product. So it's independently verified the performance. There's regional offices around the world. So this is a global association, certified product search, but they also are responsible for developing standards and publications. These standards are also adopted through ASHRAE and ANSI and everything else. Now, why do we talk about it? First off, there's a standard handbook. Here's a, another publication and field performance, just some of its most popular example ones. But this is all having to do with the certified ratings program. So not only air, but also sound. We're not gonna get into sound on this basics. 
Um, that'll be another topic for another day. But let's get into how fan performance is obtained. Let's go back to one of the AMCA publications that's also adopted by ANSI and ASHRAE. So there's actually test labs that have to be accredited. They can have different designs, but there's tolerances that are allowed for the construction, but not for the data that is obtained from it. So this is an example of one of a, a test chambers that we have in Springfield, Missouri. We can put a fan on it and we have a way to open and close nozzles and we can verify what the performance of the fan is. That fan is then cross-checked at one of the uh, AMCA headquarter labs and then it becomes certified and it comes up for reevaluation in a number of years. Now, this is actually a belt drive fan, but if you'll notice, it has a shaft sticking out of the top. Why does it have a shaft sticking out of the top? Well, it is actually tested as a direct drive to get the data. Why is it tested as a direct drive? It still has the bearing drag, but that allows it to take multiple measurements to develop the product performance data. As Tom mentioned a little bit ago, our product catalogs. And that's where the data goes into that. Now, we're getting away from published data and catalogs for multiple reasons. And it all goes into the computer program, selection program, and it spits out that data. I'm going to show you here in a little bit how some of that generates and comes about. For the sound lab, that's, that's some photos of our acoustical lab showing that. But once again, that's a topic for a different day. So a belt drive fan we mentioned earlier, it would have its shaft extended, the fan shaft, and go from there. And that's a direct drive fan, similar to what we've shown previously in another class. But let's get into the certified products. Of course, you can always go to the website of AMCA and double check, but the certified ratings program has a very specific process, as I mentioned earlier. If you want to do a deep dive in that, feel free to go to the AMCA website and download this publication for free and see this. So there's a wide range of certified products. And here is an example of this. So the center ones that fan efficiency grades, those have gone away. Um, that was a method that was discussed early for efficiency compliance. That has now evolved into the fan energy index and you'll see those on the bottom. So you'll see the older style certifications, the blue and yellow, and now the um, newer efficiency, as well as the air and sound performance, the fan energy index, those are the types of certifications that are on that. So additional info, the catalogs, as Tom mentioned and I mentioned earlier. So for a belt drive fan, it'll show all the different ones, all the different sizes, but we don't test every single RPM. We actually, do several things that we'll talk about here in a little bit. I already mentioned the fan is not tested with belt and pulleys. It is it has an extended shaft, but we do use the bearings on the fan so that we have the friction loss of the use of the uh, in the performance of the fan. So only the catalog fan shaft brake horse powers catalog. Drive loss. This is something that's very important. This is something that some folks make allowances for, some folks do not. If you do not make allowances for drive loss, um, I would strongly recommend that you consider making allowances for drive loss because you will come up short at some point in the future if you haven't already because you don't have enough horsepower to account for the the friction between the belts and the shifts. This is a out of an AMCA standard. And uh, you can actually um, see part of that in the engineering cookbook and also in our software. And I'm sorry, it, 
I said standard, it's actually a publication. But um, right there is an abridgment and it's right there. That was based upon data that was done in the 60s and 70s. Um, there is actually an ASHRAE research project that is right now wrapping up. It started in 2016, it got officially funded in 2018. And um, it's all to take into account to have a wider range of that friction loss between the belt and the shivs to obtain better real world data on friction loss in the different styles of shivs and belts that are more available. So Ampka fan manufacturers are allowed to catalog and the brake horsepower um, in the motor service factor. Why are we allowed to do that? It's really to show the performance of the fan. It doesn't give you a green light to do it, just shows the full performance parameters. So it's not an excuse to operate in, in the brake horsepower just because it's there. So let's take a look at an old style catalog and look at it in a little bit more detail. This is one of the power roof ventilators. So the mushroom style fans, this is a down blast. This is a 30 inch diameter wheel. Um, right here, you can see that there's a fan RPM called out. And in this case, it is 573. You can see a range of pressure resistance and how that performance goes up and down. You also can see the sound and you can see the brake horsepower. We're gonna do a little bit of deep dive in that data. But first, I want to show the drive loss video. And the reason I wanna show that is, this is going to reinforce what I've talked about thus far about the friction of the belts on the ships. Okay, let's see if this works. That was why I didn't want to do. Is that sound coming through? Sure. Drive loss, what it is and how to account for it. When selecting belt drive fans, it is important to consider drive loss. Drive loss is the energy that is consumed by the drive components, which commonly includes bearings, belts, and pulleys. Sometimes it includes couplings and can include items like gears and VFDs. This diagram, adapted from AMCA Standard 203, shows how drive losses vary over the typical range of horsepower applied to fans and blowers. You can see the diagram shows losses as a percentage of motor output power versus the actual motor horsepower. The middle line represents an average and can be used to estimate drive loss unless more information is available for a specific application. As the chart indicates, smaller motors tend to have greater drive loss on a percentage basis. Some software selection programs allow you to account for drive loss when selecting belt drive fans. Let's take a look at the impact of drive loss on fan energy consumption. In this demonstration, we are using a single phase third horsepower motor, as well as a watt meter to measure energy consumption in real time. First, we will energize the motor without any connected load. The motor consumes power, in this case roughly 122 watts, even without a load. When we connect to a shaft and bearings via a direct coupling, the power consumption jumps to approximately 140 watts, an increase of nearly 15%. If we connect the motor to shaft and bearings in the conventional method with a common V-belt, the power consumption jumps again, 
this time to almost 175 watts, varying as the belt tension changes. The additional energy is related to the friction between the belt and shiv, and the energy necessary to flex the belt as it goes around the pulleys. A belt that is in bad condition will consume about the same amount of power, but as can be seen here, will cause vibration that is bad for the fan, the motor, and the bearings. Additionally, improper belt alignment can cause increased power consumption, reduce belt life, and can introduce harmful vibration. To recap, for proper selection of belt drive fans, drive loss should be considered in the power consumption of the fan. Smaller motors experience a higher percentage of drive loss than do larger motors. Proper installation and alignment of drives is important in reducing fan energy consumption and minimizing maintenance. Check belts periodically to make sure they are in good condition and properly aligned and tensioned to minimize unnecessary vibration. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to our channel and watch for more videos. If you have suggestions about any subjects you would like to see covered, send them to marketing at laurencook.com. you would like to subscribe to and tension to minimize unnecessary vibration. Thanks for watching. Okay, now we're going to get into the fan curves in detail. Remember, I said where the data, root data comes from. It actually comes from a test lab. It's verified. So the catalog and software showed a little bit of that catalog right there. We're going to go back in to the data. And at the bottom, it does share standard error. That's why we talked about that just a little bit ago. Click or catch up. So the computer whether you use our online software, whether you use the mobile software, whether you use the install software, it's all pulling the same data and it'll generate curves. Now, this is an old style fan curve. This is what um, some of the older generation feels most comfortable with. It's able to be spit out from the computers. It's in some of the old uh, catalog data. Let's go in and read this. I actually had to go into a Pretty in-depth explanation just recently with one of the more experienced uh, folks we had. And we're going to look at the CFM versus pressure put in. And before this page, um, we have a wide range of product that can do that. In the future, with some energy regulations, we may not be able to show every option on there because it may not be efficient enough. But right now, you may get 10 different selections for the same CFM versus pressure. This is blowing up one of the fan curves to show what it looks like. And we're going to look at that in detail. We're going to keep this in the simplified fan curve. And we'll look at this. So what we have is we have an axis with the volume of CFM across versus the pressure. This curve right here is actually based upon an RPM. So as we increase the pressure, we reduce the flow. This right here is known as a do not select curve. I'm always hesitant on the do not select curve because some folks can go on autopilot and say, oh, it's to the right of do not select curve. I can't get in trouble. That could be furthest from the fact. I can take anyone's fan and have it this far down on the curve. And with two duct fittings, I can completely screw up the fan and the performance. So just because you're to the right of the do not select curve does not mean that you are safe. On the flip side, it's a wonderful tool to give a warning of, hey, I'm getting close. Now with the energy efficiency regulations, 
you will not be allowed to make selections as far away. In other words, having that amount of safety factor because it, it's not very efficient. You'll be driven to make selections higher up the fan curve. You have to get in within 15 points of peak total efficiency. It's already baked into code for 90.1 compliance, and you have to be within 10 points of peak total efficiency for the reach codes in 189. That being the case, the further up the fan curve you go, the closer you are into an unstable region. I'm gonna show that in more detail very soon, but just giving you an overview right off the bat. So once again, pressure, flow, but I didn't touch on this one yet. This is actually a independent curve overlay that's showing the horsepower or brake horsepower as the case may be used. That's the old style simplified way. You can see how the horsepower goes from there. And I still like to show that because this shows some of the different RPM setting. Notice I didn't say RPMs because you can't have a revolution per minute per second. Um, yeah, I'll never let that one go for using my an entire letter grade on a homework assignment. Um, but anyway, so let's go back to our catalog data and that 573 RPM. Once again, we're not changing the speed of the fan. We're just adjusting the pressure. And as you can see right off the bat, the brake horsepower increases and then it starts to come back down at that three quarters of an inch pressure. So we start at 1.42, we peak at 1.56, and then we come back down to 1.53. Let's look at this visually. I like to call this follow the dancing ball. Um, so this is our initial point, 91.15. And let's increase the pressure. So we're moving up that RPM curve. <laughs> Increasing the pressure some more. We're moving further up, further up, further up. So these are all those points that's on that RPM curve. Once again, at that 573 RPM. So the do not select curve that I already mentioned, we're to the right on all of that. Blowing that up just a little bit more. I mentioned earlier, but I'm going to show you how this leads to a point past the do not select curve as an unstable operation. Now, the do not select curve is an actual arbitrary fan manufacturer dependent location. Some people can be more conservative and have it further down the curve, and some people can be more. Um, Let's just say running it to the red line and have it further up. AMPCA doesn't care if you use a do not select curve or not. AMPCA doesn't care where you locate it. It's all based upon the fan manufacturer. That's one of the reasons that the current software has the ability to turn it on and turn it off. The next generation one, we're locking it on. So let's talk a little bit more about this unstable operation. So for a very small pressure change, you can get a very large CFM change. That's why, and we can show this in some detail, something called a fan surge. So we are significantly affecting the performance of the fan when we get up into this higher range. And that's why we, we want to stay away from that point of operation. That point of operation is not it dances, just for want of a better term. It's not stable. And uh, as it dances, you can get multiple um, performance points, and it is darn near impossible to measure that with a test and balance rule. You can hear it, but a pitot tube is not capable of measuring turbulence. Can you, Brent, can you just expand for just a little bit? So when you get a fan balance report from an unstable fan. Yes. Does it say, oh, this fan's unstable? It, and 
believe it or not, I have had some test and balance reports where the test and balance contractor <clears throat> did make that statement. But in most cases, in most cases, they do not make that statement. Some of the better test and balance contractors will take three readings to demonstrate that. Some of the really good ones will make a statement. This fan is obviously in search, but most of the time, most test and balance reports that I see, just take a reading, put it on there and go from there. And that's one of the reasons that a lot of the requests are made of where was this point taken? So was a pedo tube taken in an elbow? I'll tell you right off the bat, any reading taken in an elbow is more likely than not completely <clears throat> turbulent. And which if they're gonna put one of the readings on, yes, they put the low one, the middle one, or that, the high one. Exactly. And you don't know. Yeah. You Usually they're gonna put the high one. Why do they want to put the high one on there? So they can get off the job site. That's right. That so is bouncers are there to make money too, and they don't get paid to go back. That's correct. That is absolutely correct. And that that's driving home the point that we were getting to. So let's go back to this right before we come up on our point. We already hit on the brake horsepower, or, but our brake point. But we also, on all the test data, define which installation type the fan is installed and tested with. Now, different fan styles, Chris alluded to it a little bit earlier, have different housing styles and they operate in different manners depending upon how they're installed. That's one of the reasons that AMCA test standard actually has a lot of different installation types. I will tell you right now that if you ever get a test and balance report and the fan is running better than the catalog, and I've seen them, be skeptical because the test data is done with the best setup for that style of fan that exists. So, but I have seen some that actually had better performance logged on the test report and it's, it's just, it's not capable. All right, so the online software, it prints the same way. Um, it kicks it all out. The fan curves of the online one is, are actually a little bit, they're dynamic fan curves. So you can actually move up and down the RPM curve and get the exact point on the exact pressure, which the install program doesn't have that ability. So what we're going to do, because we're right at 10 o'clock, we wanted a, what was it, a five minute? Uh, you get 10? A five or 10, we can make a 10 and then we'll come back and we'll do a fan curve video to recap what we just went. Let's make it seven, it's 9.58, we'll be back here at 10.05. Right, you've still got everybody in the remote audience, so. Awesome. You've done well. So I haven't put anybody to sleep yet, or if they have. As far as, how would we know? How do we know? <laughs> if, if we have put somebody to sleep, they haven't turned off their, their remote. So we're going to- Do you know that we can secretly monitor them? I know, but we weren't supposed to tell them that. <laughs> okay. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Let's see if this works. Let's examine the key elements of a fan curve and how they can be used to make better fan selections. Most of us use fan selection software to assist in making fan selections. Selection software is an efficient tool and can save a lot of time. Typically, the output data is in tabular form, with many fans meeting our selection criteria. Which one is best? Along with our criteria, such as physical size and sound performance, fan curves can help us refine our selection. Let's examine the key elements of fan curve and how they can be used to make better fan selections. This is a fan curve. It represents the airflow of a fan at a constant speed over a range of pressures. For the purposes of our discussion, we will use IP units of measure. The horizontal axis represents airflow in CFM, or cubic feet per minute. The vertical axis represents pressure or resistance to airflow in inches water gauge. This is the point of maximum flow when there is no resistance. 
This point is the maximum pressure the fan can develop when the airflow has been completely blocked off. All points in between these two represent the performance of this fan at a constant speed. Let's connect this fan to a system. The curve intersecting the fan curve is called a system curve. It represents the resistance of a system. As long as nothing in the system changes, the system curve will not change. The point of intersection of these two curves is the operating point of the fan. If something in the system changes, such as the opening or closing of a damper, the system curve will change. More resistance, steeper curve. Less resistance, shallower curve. As the system curve changes, the point of operation changes, and the fan moves more or less air, all at the same fan speed. This is often referred to as riding the fan curve. As mentioned before, a fan curve represents the performance of a fan at a constant speed. If we change the speed of the fan, we move the fan curve. Increase the fan speed, and the curve moves up and to the right. Slow the fan down, and the curve moves down and to the left. The point of operation is the new intersection between fan curve and system curve. Going back to our original flow versus pressure curve, we will often see a curve referred to as a surge line or do not select line. What does this mean? The line is an indication that you are getting into an area of instability where small changes in pressure can result in large changes in airflow. The actual line or curve itself should not be viewed in black and white terms but rather indicates that careful consideration should be used when selecting a fan in this area. Any selection near or to the left of this curve can result in an unstable fan performance. Selecting to the left of this line is a definite no-no, but selecting slightly to the right can also result in a less than ideal selection. Let's take a look at selections on different areas of the curve to get a better idea of what we are talking about. This selection point is on a steep part of the fan curve. A relatively large pressure change results in a small change in airflow. This selection point is on a shallow part of the curve. Immediately you see that a much smaller change in pressure results in a larger change in airflow than with the previous selection. This is not desirable in most fan selections. Combining the two selection points, we clearly see the difference. Another concept in the use of fan curves is that of fan size. Fans in the same family will have similar fan curves. A smaller fan must run faster to give the same airflow at a given pressure, but the operating point will be on a steeper, more stable part of the curve. Remembering this can help if you are looking at a selection near the top of the curve. Take a look at the curve for the next smaller size fan in that family, as it may be a better selection point. If your fan is going to operate over a range of speeds in a system with changing conditions, you need to look at the performance over the operating range. This range is bounded by the fan curve at max and minimum speeds and by the system curves at highest and lowest system pressures. As you can see, the fan curve flattens out as the fan slows down. If an improper selection is made, instability can occur at the lowest speed. Some centrifugal fans can be made in different widths. Narrowing the width of a wheel with a given diameter reduces the airflow. The ratio of the width reduction corresponds roughly to the ratio of airflow reduction at a given pressure, up to a point. In this case, a 10% wheel reduction results in a 10% airflow reduction at a given pressure. Why would you want this? Let's look. The operating point on the original full width fan curve may be uncomfortably close to the top of the curve. Here, we see the sped up narrow wheel results in the operating point being on a more stable part of the curve. Here is an example using selection software. This fan selection is for a size 195 ACE direct drive with a full width wheel. The fan is turning 1298 RPM and the operating point is high on the fan curve. Here, we see the identical selection for the same fan, but with a 10% reduction in wheel width. The fan speed is 4.5% greater than the full width wheel. 
but the selection point is lower on the curve. Narrow width wheels are not always an option and can increase the cost of the fan. This option is generally suggested by the fan manufacturer only when the other standard options are exhausted. Until now, we have looked only at airflow and pressure. Let's take a look at power consumption. At each operating point, the fan consumes a specific amount of energy. The power consumption can be charted as horsepower versus airflow. Each point on the airflow versus pressure curve corresponds with a point on the airflow versus horsepower curve, which we will refer to here as the power curve. For convenience, we tend to combine these two graphs, overlaying the power curve on the flow pressure curve. Drawing a line up from the desired airflow, we read the pressure on the left vertical axis corresponding to the intersection between the fan curve and system curve and continue vertically to the power curve, reading the corresponding power on the vertical axis to the right. Occasionally, the system curve, fan curve, and power curve intersect at the same point on the graph. This is purely a coincidence, having to do with the scaling of the two overlaid graphs and is otherwise meaningless. If we change the scale of the fan curve or power curve, the points would move accordingly. Let's recap. As you can see, fan curves contain a lot of information. The visual nature of these graphs can be very useful in helping to ensure the most reliable and stable fan operation. Keep in mind that different size fans in the same family will operate at higher or lower points on the curve for the same performance. Evaluating the location of the operating point on the curve is of prime importance. Take into account varying conditions such as variable fan speed and or system pressure when making selections. Narrow width wheels can be a solution when standard selections are exhausted. Contact your manufacturer's representative for guidance and assistance with such selections. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to our channel and watch for more videos. If you have suggestions about any subjects you would like to see covered, send them to marketing at laurencook.com. So, Brent, yes. do the engineer versions of the software allow fan reduction, wheel width reduction? They do for um, certain products. So, um, Certain products that does have the option of that, uh, the 33% and the 50% wheel reduction, that comes into play. Um, but in the, engineering version. in the engineering version on some of the products, the rep version has the greater ability on some of that. And then of course, our version has a lot more. Okay. Yeah. So if you, if so if an engineer is trying to pick a fan and just can't quite get a good one, we should be able to do more. You should be able to help them out significantly. Okay. And yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. And um, one of the things that I did a broad stroke when I was doing how the fan curves were developed and how to read a fan curve, knowing that that YouTube video is out there on our fan channel, so you can go back and go into more detail. But I wanted to do a deep dive on part of that, of the fan curve, because those that part is the absolute basic, and that's also the one that I get the most frequent questions. The deep dive that we do on the um, video, that's more, much, much more experienced types of folks. And when they're really trying to thread the needle, shall we say, and go into that. Um, so, but that's out there. You can go to our YouTube channel. You can review that at any time that you want. So now we're going to get into one of the more challenging subjects, um, the fan laws. It's not as in-depth as we take it to the more advanced classes, but you're going to get put in the deeper part of the swimming pool right off the bat here. And the reason this comes into play is this helps significantly if you're trying to get more performance out in the field, but it also explains where we get some of the performance from. So let's go back to the catalog data. 
I know I'm old school, but I like to see show where some of this stuff came from the dimensional data. So this is one whole product family from a really small to a really large fan. So a six inch nominal wheel up to a 54 inch nominal wheel. So obviously we don't have to test every single size, every single speed to get the data, but we use something called the fan affinity laws to hit the intermediate points, provided that every product is proportional. Not every product in the industry, not every manufacturer uses proportional sizes between that. But if the product line and the product style is proportional from the different sizes, then you can use the fan laws and you can go in and use this data and it holds. So the fan affinity laws, you can go to the ASHRAE terminology sheet. You can read about that. That's all great. I'm just showing different versions and then I'm going to give you a lot of details. Yes, I go back to the ASHRAE handbook. Um, I, I'm pretty fond of one chapter, uh, chapter 21, the fans chapter. Um, but specifically, we're going to go into, and then there is one in depth um, table that's called the fan loss. And I'm going to show this. And this looks very challenging to most people and it should because it's it's got a lot of dependent variables it's got a lot of law numbers and unless you really are a fan manufacturer or unless you really just want to geek out doing a deep dive into this is most often not necessarily let's do it no let's not um I don't drink, but I would probably require a lot of alcohol to be able to. Come drink. on, Brent, it'll be <laughs> fun. But uh, uh, flow pressure and watts. Yeah, yeah, it's it's got a lot of things in it. This goes all the way back to when Willis Carrier was a fan engineer, and the old infamous Bible called Fan Engineering Handbook. This is where some of this was first published. And uh, this is the current version of the chapter. And it goes into all of these with coefficients and Reynolds number and everything else. And the only reason I do this is I want you to see how complex it can be and then how simplified it becomes because there's a lot of different ways to look at it. There's a lot of different schools of thought where it comes into the fan laws. Um, once again, it has to do with the diameter of the fan, the density of the air. So yes, I'm pulling things that we talked about over an hour ago into this. So let's boil it all down to the simplified fan affinity laws, which are as shown on the screen. CFM varies directly with the RPM. Static pressure, because yes, we are in English units, um, we're not going to get into the difference between static pressure and total pressure. I gave an overview on that, um, but static pressure varies with the square of the RPM of the fan and horsepower varies with the cube of the RPM of the fan. Why do I go into this at this point in detail? Well, number one, if you do need to get more performance in the field, we already talked about a test and balance report briefly. If you need to increase the performance, it is highly unlikely that you're going to go and change the ductwork. So you have a preset ductwork configuration. And as you draw more air through the same preset duct configuration, your pressure is going to develop and increase. So as your pressure increases, you're going your RPM, of course, is of the fan is going to increase, and your pressure is going to vary with the square of the RPM. But there are still, shall we say, speed limits in play. You're going to require a lot more brake horsepower because it varies with what? The cube of the RPM. So here's what often happens. Folks will go back to catalog data and say, oh, well, I don't understand why I need this lower amount of 
I should need this lower amount of brake horsepower, but you're saying you're going to need a whole lot more brake horsepower if we increase the airflow. Well, once again, you're not changing the ductwork. You've got a reading that sets your lower boundary and you want more airflow. So you're going to have to fan lot up and therefore your RPM is going to increase based upon that specific system that you've taken measurements for and your brake horsepower. It's not a simple case of going back and looking at the raw data to get more horsepower. I'm going to go into that a little bit more detail, but I do want you to know Andy Dandy cookbook, it's got it in there and it is simplified. And if you really want to get a little bit on the fringe, I've given some, we've given some examples right there where you can do a little bit more in-depth calculations. You can also download a free cook tool for your smartphone and you can check it. This comes in very handy if you're out in the field and or if you've got a test and balance report and you wanna up it and go from there. It's also in the software and goes from there. And it's not only the install, but the online version. It's a whole lot easier than setting all this up in a spreadsheet and going in and going back. So let's look at field performance data. You would normally get a test and balance report. I may or may not be protecting the guilty on part of this, but um, right there. And what we're going to see is you've got your design CFM and you've got your actual CFM. In this case, it's also being operated with a variable frequency drive. So a variable frequency drive, and we go into more in depth on that in the advanced class, it actually speeds it up if you go over 60 Hertz. And if you go below 60 Hertz with a variable frequency drive, so it slows it down. So whether you have a belt drive or a direct drive, you're affecting the speed of that motor shaft and how that translates into everything else along those lines. So in this case, we also have a suction, but we do not have a discharge static pressure. This particular product discharges into the atmosphere. So that's why you do not have a discharge static pressure. If it was ducted in, ducted out, you'd have the static pressure on the, on the suction side, you have the static pressure on the discharge side, and here is something that often comes up. You must take the absolute value of both and add them together if it is ducted in, ducted out. So in this case, if we had- Hey Brent, are the, are the, it's just a little small. Yeah. Do you want us to look at the numbers or? Um, not in detail, no. It, it's- You're just showing us a balance yeah. report. Just showing us what a balance report looks like if you haven't seen one before. That's correct. Okay. Just that check. is correct. No, and, and sorry, it's not coming through. And then we ask for more detail with the system sketch. But for instance, if you had a ducted in, ducted out configuration, and you had on the suction side, because you're pulling, it would be like minus 1.0. And on the discharge, because you had more duct work on the discharge, it was 1.5. The pressure would be 1.0 plus 1.5, even though you had negative, you don't add it together, as you, it'd be 2.5, it would not be 0.5. Let that sink in for a little bit. So the absolute value on, one, on the suction versus the discharge and add it together. Okay, so this one, this one's blown up a little bit more. So I cannot stress enough, we need to know where the readings were taking place. Sometimes it's a summation of a flow hood way far away, and we don't have any idea what that pressure is in the duct system to get to the fan. But all this comes into play where if you need to get more airflow through a system, you need to have this root data that then you then plug into the fan loss to see how much more RPM you're going to need, and more importantly, how much more brake horsepower you'll need to overcome the resistance. 
We already talked a little bit about the difference in total pressure and static pressure. And then what do you do if you need more field performance? Once again, CFM varies directly with the RPM, static pressure varies with the square, horsepower varies with the cube. Can't stress this enough. So on a belt drive fan, let's talk about speed adjustment on that. Belt drive fan, you've got your belts, you've got your shifts. Obviously you can change the shifts and uh, uh, some folks refer to them as pulleys, but this is what I'm talking about. So you have your motor shiv, which I mean, can- I don't know that that's actually obvious to most engineers who haven't put a, haven't been to a fan manufacturer before, but those pulleys, you can adjust the travel distance of the belt and change the RPM. Or are you gonna dig it? Looks like you're digging into it. Or you had those already. Yeah, yeah. So I'll just shut up. No, it's all good. Yeah, it's all good. So this right here, and because Tom hit on the nail on the head, why it's not necessarily obvious. Um, and I didn't bring my little sampling in it where you can adjust it. But this is a shift or a pulley. Hopefully you can see this pretty well on here. But this is a variable shift. It's a dot. <laughs> So yeah, it's just a Can you dot. switch the camera for one second? Yeah. Thanks, Tamara. My able body Vanna White. All right. Can you see this? Hey, look at that. So this is a variable shift. If you notice, I can open it up and I can close it down. Now this is a single groove shift, so only one belt. There's also double, triple, and some other styles, but we adjust the speed that the belt travels based upon how open or closed the shift is located. The variable by convention, and I don't wanna to get too far out of screenshot, goes on the motor as I show above. This is a fixed shift. This actually goes on the fan shaft. So once again, single, but it goes from here. All right. Now, let me step out of screenshots very quickly and come back in. There's a wide range of different styles of shifts and belts. And sometimes some of the shivs need an adapter piece. So this is showing that bushing that would allow it to fit on a different shaft. But all this comes into play. But also, and I think we're good to, to zoom out again for a little bit. Thank you. So part of that calculation, you can do really long drawn out calculations um, some of our old timers at the factory did them. There were drive books, but now there's computer programs that do it all. But you have to take into account the distance between these two. And, and yeah, I'm getting way deep in the weeds. But the point of the matter is, this is how you adjust the speed of a belt-driven fan. You change the, the shivs and belts or pulleys and belts, whichever terminology that you may have. So that goes from there. So this is an example right out in the field and what that looks like. So you can see the bearings that are on there. She's a beauty, Brent. She's a beauty. She is. And there are different styles of bearings. We're not gonna get into that way deep on this, but this is an example of the bearing that I show in the photo right there. And this is looking at it from a different side. Here is the key on a belt. If you ever see somebody take a long handled screwdriver and pry that belt off and put a new belt on that way, grab that screwdriver out of their hands, flip it around where that handle is on the opposite side and whack them on the knuckles, whack them hard. Why? Thou shalt not, okay? 
Thou shalt not change a belt with a long handled screwdriver. Why? There's actually cords inside that belt. I have been in, in experimental belt labs um, where they develop it. You will break those cords inside the belt if you use that. That's why there are devices such as the motor slide base to take that tension off, put that on and off. I know what's done in the field. You have to be very careful so that you do not affect the belt life. The other thing that gets into play is you have to keep that belt alignment. Everything that's in our IONM from these things comes from belt and ship manufacturers. And if you'll notice, if you look at our IONM, some of our competitors' IONM, a lot of it looks very similar. Some, some of us have a little pretty picture, prettier pictures than others, but the point of the matter is the root data is very similar because it all comes from the shivs and belt manufacturers and their experience with allowing their product to work the best. This is something that we worked to have drawn up years ago. Um, I can't stress enough how important it is that lower alignment portion is incorrect because if you're like this, that belt flexes and travels incorrectly. But it, if it's lined up and it does not matter whether this attachment point is here or this attachment point is there, the importance is this is lined up. All right, now, you had to listen to me. Now I'm gonna show you something right off the bat that shows it a lot better through a video and you can come back and watch it anytime you want. It also discusses something called an automatic belt tensioner. Talk Before you hop on, yep. Heidi has a question about how much can you just, which I know it depends, yep. and roughly how much can you adjust the speed of a fan by adjusting the ship? That's a great question, Heidi. And it depends on the size of the fan and the style of the fan. But I would say without changing the shivs, probably about 15% is a good rule of thumb. In some cases it's lower, some cases it's higher, but I'd say 10 to 15% good rule of thumb in most cases. Any, uh, any follow up on that, on my answer? Nope. Uh, I got okay, thank you. Okay, good. All right, so we're going to play this. Maybe. Fan speed, how fast the fan impeller rotates, is a key factor affecting fan performance. As you can see from this typical performance fan curve, as the speed increases, the fan is able to deliver more airflow and develop more pressure. The fan speed here is indicated as fan RPM or revolutions per minute. Understanding how to set or change fan speed for a belt drive is an essential part of ensuring proper fan performance. Let's see how this works. Most belt driven fans utilize motors that rotate at a nominal speed of 1750 RPM. Other motor speeds you may commonly see are 3450, 1140, 860, and 690 RPM motors. Motors, either single phase or three phase, and whether they are open drip proof, totally enclosed, or rated for hazard location, will have a nameplate with the motor RPM labeled. Each motor manufacturer's motor nameplate design is slightly different, so take some time to locate the RPM for the motor on your fan. Here we have a belt driven fan with a variable speed drive set, also commonly referred to as a variable pitch drive set. In this video, you will also see a device referred to as a belt tensioner. As we said, the most common motor speed applied to belt-driven fans is 1750, but the required fan speed to deliver the specified performance is almost always different than the motor speed. To achieve a fan speed other than the motor speed, belt-driven fans use a combination of different pulley or shiv diameters on the motor and fan shafts to increase or decrease the fan speed compared to the motor speed. If the motor pulley and fan pulley are the same diameter, 
the fan will operate at the motor speed. On this fan, the fan pulley is larger than the motor pulley. As you can see, for every revolution of the motor pulley, the fan pulley only rotates less than one half of a revolution. So the fan shaft will rotate less than one half the motor speed. At this point, we need to talk safety. Before beginning to work on a fan, you will need to read and understand the manufacturer's installation and operation manual. Check with the manufacturer or manufacturer's rep to make sure that the fan and motor can operate safely at the desired new speed. Turn off the power to the fan motor before performing any work and take the proper steps to ensure the power cannot be turned on while the fan is being worked on. Now that we know how drives determine the fan rotating speed, let's see how to change the speed. This may be needed once the fan is installed to overcome additional system pressure. To change the speed of a belt-driven fan, we must first remove the belt. The fan shown has a belt tensioner. The belt tensioner extends the life of the belt by maintaining proper tension. It has the added benefit of making belt removal extremely easy. Simply push on the belt tensioner until the belt can be slipped over the fan and motor pulleys. Most fans provided with motors of 5 horsepower or less should be specified or ordered with a variable speed or variable pitch drive set. The pulley mounted on the motor, sometimes referred to as the drive shiv, is adjustable and provides an adjustment range of approximately 20% or more without needing to replace the pulley. To adjust the effective diameter of the pulley, locate the set screw on the top of the pulley using the correct size hex key or allen wrench. Loosen, but do not remove the set screw. To adjust the pulley, hold the bottom half of the pulley with one hand while turning the top half of the pulley. Do not force the pulley. If the top half of the pulley does not turn freely, then the shiv may be damaged and will need to be replaced. Turning the pulley clockwise closes the pulley, increasing its effective diameter and increasing the fan speed. Turning the pulley counterclockwise opens the pulley, decreasing the effective diameter and decreasing the fan speed. When setting the pulley, always turn the pulley clockwise until it's fully closed. From that point, turn it counterclockwise the appropriate number of turns to attain the proper speed. This setting is commonly referred to as the number of turns open. Once the desired setting is achieved, make sure the set screw lines up with the flat spot where there are not threads to interfere with the set screw. Tighten the set screw per manufacturer's recommendations, which can be found in the fan's installation and operation manual. Once this is completed, reinstall the belt. First, position the belt on the belt tensioner. Apply pressure to the tensioner and slip the belt over the fan and motor pulleys. Before running the unit, we must check belt alignment. When we change the effective diameter of the drive pulley, we also change the center line of the belt as it rides in that pulley. Now the belt is misaligned. Misalignment of the belt will cause increased belt wear, leading to premature failure of the belt. This also contributes to belt noise and additional horsepower required to turn the belt. For proper alignment, the center lines of the pulleys need to be in alignment. Aligning the tops of the pulleys will not ensure proper alignment and may compound the misalignment problem. To adjust the motor pulley for proper alignment, locate the set screws on the bottom side of the pulley. Some pulleys will only have one set screw, while others will have two set screws. Loosen, but do not remove the set screws. Raise or lower the pulley to achieve the proper belt alignment, visually checking that the centers of the pulleys are in alignment. Tighten the set screw per manufacturer's guidelines. Let's recap. Fan speed, how fast the fan impeller rotates, is a key factor affecting fan performance. Field adjustment of fan speed may be required to deliver proper fan performance. Always check for belt alignment after adjusting fan speed. Before working on a fan, always disconnect and lock out power in accordance with all recommended safety practices. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to our channel and watch for more videos. If you have suggestions about. Okay. So. I know that was had some items that were a little bit more advanced, but I also know that there are some intermediate folks that are on this there on this uh, Zoom presentation. So if you want to go deeper, you've got that on the video. If you want to stay where we were with the basics, you've got that as well. And if you've gotten to the point where you get into something later. You know where you can go to get some of that. But um, so that is a belt drive. 
Now, by no means are we going to go into the depth that we went in with belt and direct drive fans that we did on the advanced class on Tuesday, but we are going to do some overall broad overview strokes. So direct drive, this is simplified showing it, same style of fan, power roof ventilator, but the motor is directly coupled to the wheel, where if you remember on the belt drive fan, the motor was flipped up at the belt and pulley, and it went from there. So this is something that I frequently tell my seven-year-old, get what you get, so don't throw a fit. Okay, now why do I say that? With a direct drive, the motor runs a specific speed unless you have a motor adjustment. So this is a permanent split capacitor and a shaded pole. These are some of the motors that were originally ruled out of existence because they were highly inefficient. And there's just a few of them that are still left, but these were very, very cost-effective styles of motors. And you would adjust the speed with basically a glorified rheostat, which is called a fan speed control. So it chops the sine wave. Yes, I'm not trying to get in the weeds, but what I want you to realize is there's specific limitations with these fan speed controllers. They're not designed to be on off switches. So don't mount them in a room. And there are specific instructions for how much you can turn them down in the field when you're installing them or else you'll fry the motor. Um, they're not as readily available as they once were, as I mentioned, because a lot of the motors were ruled out of existence, but they're still around and they're still a workhorse of the industry. Now, on Tuesday, we did a deep dive on an EC or an electronically commutated motor, whether it was standard and it is what it is when it comes from the motor manufacturer, or if it's pre-programmed at a fan manufacturer or a pre-programmed permanent magnet. Now, one of the reasons I left these from our talk on Tuesday is some of these are examples of these different styles of motors. Once again, we're not going to get into a deep dive that we did like on Tuesday, that's reserved for the advanced class, but you can notice, let's see, I don't think we need to zoom in on this. Um, but you'll notice there's a lot of electronics in this. EC stands for electronically commutated. PM means a permanent magnet. All three of these motors up there on the screen are actually permanent magnet motors. So if it has the ability to change the AC current from the system to DC current, built in or on the motor, then it is known as an EC motor. If it needs a separate motor controller, then it is known as a permanent magnet controller. You can get all these from the fan manufacturer. You don't have to come up with things in the field. You don't have to stress out about it, but there's different methods of speed control with the different types of the unit of the motor. And also along these lines, these motors are becoming more and more available and more and more across a wide range of horsepowers. I said, we, we, we go into a much greater detail and in-depth version in the advanced class. So I think the videos from Tuesdays are available if you wanna do a little bit deeper dive. But the point of the matter is this is one method of direct drive fan speed adjustment. It's more complicated than the little fan speed controller that I showed that goes from there. This is also one of the feature available that you can have a direct drive speed adjustment, but this one can be mounted in the wall. So you can actually adjust it. The next item that comes up is something known as a variable frequency drive, a VFD. Those go with standard induction motors. They also go with permanent magnet motors. So it goes from there. Lab data versus field data. Let's talk about that in more detail. So we discussed where that came from, how that came about. So back to the power roof ventilator. 
It is tested on the test chamber. It's normally installed in the field with a roof curb. It's normally installed with a roof curb and a backdraft damper in the field. Question, is that complete data included in the catalog data or the software data? It does not. It does not include the pressure drop for the backdraft camera. And I often get the question of why? Why don't you include that? Because you know, in a lot of cases, emphasis on the word, a lot of cases, it's going to be installed with it. Not in all cases. And there's a wide range of dampers that can be installed in. It can be a power damper. It can be just a standard backdraft damper. It can be an insulated blade. It can be an airfoil. It can be blade and jam seals, everything else. That's why there's testing data separate for dampers. And then you can add which type of damper that you wish to have. And you can add the pressure from that specific damper to your system and it use the summation of your entire system design in selecting the fan. So that is one of the reasons that that accessory is not included in the root data of the fan performance. So summation does not include dampers, filters, or any guards. Some are used, some are not, and there's a lot of variation in between. Now, a lot of our product accessories, we have that performance and that pressure loss data available in the product catalogs and everything else. The other thing, and I can't emphasize this enough, I know if you're working local, but I want you to remember this because I've had more people get in trouble on this particularly in the last several years, temperature and elevation. Temperature more often than elevation, but they get in trouble on that. So one of the questions that always comes up, absolutely always comes up all the time. And as Tom mentioned, I used to be a consultant myself for a number of years before Jerry Cook gave me an offer I couldn't refuse. And uh, my old department head, actually made an assertion that, eh, there's some things that uh, fan manufacturers came up with sitting around by a fancy pool that cover manufacturing tolerances. They knew it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but this question I've had asked me so many times that I put it into the presentation years ago. So why does a fan tested in accordance with AMCA standards and is AMCA certified sometimes fail to perform up to the catalog ratings when installed in the system. And here's the term that my old department head said. The answer is system effect. Now, what do I mean by system effect? I'm not going to go into a super deep dive. I have more than eight hours worth of just photos that I've collected from my time as a consultant and my time at Cook. I have done presentation so often that I still get emails from outside of the country. Hey, I remember you. You like funny fan installations. Here's a photo I saw and sent that. And in all transparency, I don't necessarily remember the name, but I'll get that and I'll put it in my catalog file. And We have a lot of fun with it. So the engineering cookbook, once again, AMPIA publication standards handbook. If you want to go buy it, feel free, but no real do it. But we talk about inlet conditions of correct and some that are incorrect. Now, very soon, we're going to run a fan and we're going to take a look at some things. But here is what we're talking about. So you have to allow for gradual expansion or contraction. You have to have at least two and a half duct diameters for up to 2,500 feet per minute. Anything over 2,500 feet per minute, we're going to get into trouble. You got to add an additional duct diameter. A fan does not like to be choked. 
Remember that. If you cause turbulence at the inlet, you're not allowing the fan to breathe. If you're not allowing the fan to breathe, if you can't breathe in, you can't breathe out. Okay? So this is some examples right off the bat. This is all in your booklet. And you can go back and look at that. And then a fan also has to be able to breathe out. So not only breathe in, but breathe out. And if you get too radical on discharges, the fan will not perform. So here are some examples of what happens and you can see with the arrows, the turbulence and the swirling along those lines. This is where it gets fun. This is where I enjoy. This is some examples of what not to do. And so this is a power of ventilator. <clears throat> Not only does it look funny, but it has an abrupt turn right at the inlet of the fan. So first off, I hope and I pray that in a windstorm, this thing doesn't fly off. But second, there's a turbulent swirl right going into the inlet of the fan that does not allow the fan to breathe in. It can breathe out very easily, but breathe in, it cannot do. This one is a little bit better, but it is still very similar to what you just saw. And the reason why is that turn it's an oldie. is too close. Yeah, it is. That turn is too close to the inlet of the fan. It needs to have that straight duct to allow that air to straighten out. Now, as a positive, they did cut that corner out of the ductwork. And when I talk about taking the corner out, I'm talking about this section right here. That allows the air to turn a little bit better than having it swirl if that corner existed. Now, just as you can have problems with power roof and lighter, you can have problems with a utility vent set. This one, I still shake my head about every single time. And one of the benefits of this particular product line, it has a field rotatable scroll. Everything in this photo could have been averted. So one of the things that I've been challenged with, and I do a lot of discussion and education upon is rotation and discharge. I've had to do more classroom topics on that in the last three and a half years than I've had in my entire career at Cook. So rotation and discharge, if you go back to the engineering cookbook, all of the AMCA rotation and discharge is available. Now, what am I talking about rotation and discharge? So I'm using this example. Okay, this fan, all rotations are referred to from the drive side of the fan. So notice which direction my cursor is going. The drive side, meaning the motor is motors. located. Yes, correct. So this is a clockwise rotation. Notice my circular motion is clockwise. This is an up blast fan. This could have just as easily been built as a counterclockwise where this portion would have been on this side and this part of the fan would have been on that side. Could have been spun around because this is actually a free inlet fan. There's no ductwork on the inlet of this fan. Now, it also could have been top horizontal. It could have been Top angular down, it could have even been down blast. So instead of cramming the air up, over, down, back, and back into the building, 
all that could have been accounted for with just a different rotation and discharge of the same product. Your efficiency would have been radically increased because remember a fan does not like to be choked. Your sound level would have been significantly lower because as you have to account for the turbulence or even the turbulence if you don't account for it, it does create sound and all this comes into play. So the point of the matter is, as you go further up the fan curve, which code is going to be requiring you, if it has not already, to be further up that fan curve, the less an install like this is going to be able to be modified in the field. Because you're further to the quote unquote red line, the higher up the fan curve you are, and that's why we talk about the fan curves before we get into any of this discussion. And we go from there. I think we're probably due for a break. Okay, we can do that and we'll continue on on this after the break. But I'm gonna say a couple words before, if you're home, which there's a bunch of you that are, and you're kind of maybe halfway awake, halfway snoozing through this thing, I hope not, but if you are, this is, the, this is definitely a part to pay attention to. Um, if you've installed enough fans, you're gonna have a problem like this sooner or later. Um, I have like four example, three mechanical department heads have threatened to write Lauren Cook out of a specification because we had a system effect. So they see that the fan is underperforming. They see that, oh, well, all the ductwork is attached. And then they simply go, it must be a product of the fan or they come up with some strange reason why um, it's, it's got to be the fan. That, that is a really truly a lazy person's methodology for solving a problem is put it on the ma fan manufacturer. So I, I, while I've been through that, we have worked through all of our system effect problems one way or the other. Um, sometimes it's just a little thing. Sometimes it's been a big thing. But sooner or later, we get to the bottom of all of them. It's no fun when they happen. Everybody's upset. It usually costs... Sometimes the engineer, definitely the contractor, and definitely the rep, some money in order to solve the problem. So if you haven't had one yet, you're just lucky. It's just waiting out there for you. There's a lot of different things that can happen. These are some preliminary pictures. You do, oh, I'd never do that. But I, I'm almost sure, I'm almost sure you're going to run into a system effect problem one way or the other. As a matter of fact, every fan has system effects that happen to it. The only time that becomes noticeable is if you haven't estimated enough static to overcome the problem, or if you have something in the system that you hadn't foreseen before. So we're going to turn this over to Brent. We do have a system effect demo here, but because of the way our audio is working and um, it's going to be easier to show videos, but we're going to have another class in the future where we'll just do the system effect demo live. We'll have a, um, more of a full audience. Um, when it's not snowing five inches outside. Um, so we'll do that at a later date. But in the meantime, we've got Brent, we've got um, some videos to show and definitely some teaching that's gonna happen here in the last hour or so of the class. So take it away, Brent. All righty. So I don't know if some of you are in an AE firm or in a separate E firm or under an architect or what have you, but one of the most frequent things that happened when, oh, <laughs> when I was at an AE firm and it was a full service firm that I worked at was we had some architects that were very, very willing to give us all the mechanical space we needed. And some, shall we say, more inexperienced architects that didn't. What I'm about to show you on this particular example, this architect gave the mechanical space what I would call a dream for a mechanical space. And unfortunately, the communication between everybody on this project was not what it could have been. And the reason I prefaced before the break, the, the discussion on rotation and discharge 
is every system on this project could have been improved with better communication on the rotation and discharge. And when I say better communication, it was not only from the drawings, it was also at the contractor and it was also at the rep level. And the, I also preface before the break that I've had to do more discussions on rotations and discharges in the last three plus years than I have in my entire career. And a lot of that case is strictly because as we've become more of a remote world, some of that communication is not what it was when we were less remote. It's not pointing fingers, that's just reality. And so I cannot emphasize enough, use the cookbook, use another tool if you don't wanna use the cookbook, but the rotation and discharge and front end communication through the bidding, ordering, submittals, contractor, everything goes from there. So this right here, now, unfortunately, What's really frustrating is, as I mentioned, the rotation and discharge was, was uh, not properly communicated. But on this particular project, some of these fans were field rotatable. So it could have been that discharge of the fan, instead of having air come here, slam back around, slam back around and go from there, but simply that discharge could have been rotated on that fan and moved from there. So one of the things, and like I said, I'm not pointing fingers, but that communication, not only from the design, the installation and the provider, that's critical. That is absolutely critical going into there. This one, is another one. Um, I use this one almost as a poster child. This, if you'll notice, the fan discharges that way, forces it back, it breaks the backbone of the air, forces it down, back, over, back, and down. This could have been completely handled differently, thankfully. Um, this is a different fan manufacturer, but believe me, we all at AMCA and ASHRAE meetings, we all commiserate at times and we show pictures and trade them back and forth and, and go from there. Um, this one was, some peop several people lost hair over this install until some photos and build visits took place. This one, if anybody can tell me what style of fan this was originally, um, you'll get a cookie. Um, this one was heavily modified in the field because basically it was a trial and error. It's a utility set. It is a utility set. It is a utility set. It is a grease exhaust utility set from a, a, a kitchen um, Well, this is actually a balancing device right here. Oh, yeah. Variable speed. Mm -hmm. Well, and then it was also done on that because it was so much in surge. That was their only way to try to get that to work. Yeah. And I'll show a different picture on this. Now, what I haven't shown you is right on the other side of this parapet wall. This is a very high end area. There are Ferraris and Porsches and Bentleys that are valeted right on the other side of that parapet wall. So that discharge cone is actually to shoot that grease laden exhaust up higher. So it was no longer landing on the hoods of those Ferraris and Bentleys that were valeted right behind it. Um, but yeah, so this got added to try, and it's a manual damper to try to add more air to balance the turbulence when it goes in there. That's a clean out port. Uh, Tom hit it right on the head as far as grease. Of course, you can see some of the grease edging down on there. But that fan, awesome. it was completely 
adjusted, shall we say, in the field for the system to account for that. I wonder if there's a case that, you know, the contractors, God bless them, they yeah. send all of our kids to college, right? Exactly. Um, they feel like their field people know this. And then they go out into the field and they go, what did you do? That does happen. Because the PMs get trained. They go, all right. But sometimes stuff happens in the field that. It's a, that is exactly correct. And I was going to bring that up in just a little bit. Because as I stated before I started showing some of these photos and before I started getting into the rotation and discharge and some of the systems, it's a partnership between everybody. Now, sometimes, yes, on the front end, maybe the architect didn't give you enough room to do anything. Um, but this, this was one of those things that, yes, that definitely took place when the senior manager went out and goes, what the heck happened here? And, uh, but the surprising thing about it is all of these field items on here, this fan is running fine. Now, if it didn't have this device, I doubt that it would have. Um, this was rather a creative solution to keep that grease from getting on the Ferraris and the Bentleys and the Porsches. Um, but had some of these things not been done to allow the air somewhat to settle out before it got into the fan, that fan would start throwing bearings. That fan would start throwing belts. It would almost guarantee to self-destruct. And yes, this isn't pretty. This is very creative. And there was a lot of trial and error on this to do this, to get the air to settle out before it got to the fan. But I do show this just because of the whole nature of the photos. So, um, we actually, as Tom mentioned, we have two videos that we're going to, to play just from the nature of the class that set up, ended up being with the storm. These are also available online. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the videos because that's what we would have done had we been able to run this with the, with the uh, sound over the, the Zoom, but, uh, and, uh, as Tom mentioned, they're going to do a follow-up in person with this unit at a later date. You'll be able to actually come up and feel the airflow as it's affected with some of the different fittings. That's one of the things that hands down makes believers out of this when you have the opportunity to do that. So I would, I would highly encourage you when this class does take place in real life, come on out, do that. Obviously, don't stick your finger in the fan, but feel the airflow and uh, there's safety guards in place, but some of these different fittings and how that does. And then also how some of it is deliberately put into some surge conditions and you can hear that and go from there. Um, you'll, you'll get a lot of this from the videos but it, it's by no means a substitute for the additional that you'll see in real life when this happens. So we're gonna fire this thing up on the video and hopefully it'll all, all work here. A lot of emphasis is placed on the proper selection of fans and the amount of energy fans consume. System design and the fan system interface can have a dramatic effect on fan energy consumption. In this video, we will look at the effect duct design has on fan operation through differences in pressure loss. We will also touch on the subject of system effect as it relates to the fan system interface. 
To illustrate, we are utilizing a single wide, single inlet, light duty blower, often referred to as a utility set or vent set. The fan has a non-ducted inlet and length of duct connected to the discharge, a common setup in fan testing. Our duct is the same size as the fan discharge and is 48 inches long. How important is the length of the discharge duct? Let's take a closer look. AMCA, the Air Movement and Control Association, establishes test standards for fans and a certified rating program that ensures uniformity in fan testing. AMCA Standard 201 shows why discharge duct length is important. This diagram, taken from AMCA 201, shows the velocity profile at the discharge of a typical blower. You can see that as the air immediately leaves the blower, the velocity of the air in the duct varies widely. And as the air travels along the duct, it evens out. The velocity profile at the end of the duct is known as a fully developed flow and provides the opportunity for the lowest pressure loss as the duct system changes directions. Let's look at the performance of our fan with the discharge duct attached. We can see that the fan is moving approximately 1500 CFM and that there is no measurable static pressure associated with the straight discharge duct. We will use this as our benchmark as we compare the effect of different duct fittings on fan performance. It should be noted that the duct velocity is roughly 1800 feet per minute. With higher velocities, the effects we are studying will be more dramatic. We will be referring to elbow fitting using common terminology. The heel is the outer face of the elbow as it turns. The throat is the inner face of the elbow. Finally, the cheek of an elbow is one of the sides connecting the heel and throat. Now we'll place a fitting on the end of the duct. We're attaching a 90 degree square elbow to the discharge of the duct. And you can see that our pressure drop for this fitting is around 3 tenths of an inch. Adding one fitting on the system has reduced the airflow by 10%. How can one fitting have such a dramatic effect on the fan performance? To illustrate, we'll take a closer look at what's going on inside the fitting. First, we'll use a tissue to help visualize the airflow exiting the fitting. At first, the tissue acts as we would expect, blowing upward. But as we move to the throat of the elbow, we see it being pulled into the fitting, not what we expected. To visualize the airflow within the fitting, we will inject bubbles into the airstream. You can see the air flowing through the middle of the fitting as we would expect but two eddies or areas of recirculation are being formed. One in the far corner or heel of the elbow and one just after the throat. These eddies create inefficiency and unnecessary pressure loss, wasting fan energy. Let's take a minute to evaluate the ramifications. If we encountered this in the field and needed 1500 CFM and are only getting 1340 CFM, we would need to speed the fan up to get the required airflow. Our demo fan is running 1574 RPM and consuming 0.25 brake horsepower. Using the fan laws, we calculate that the fan would need to run 1762 RPM with a new brake horsepower of 0.35 to get the required airflow. Unfortunately, in this case, the motor on our demo fan is a quarter horse motor and would need to be replaced with a larger motor to get the required performance. You can see the problems that can arise when the system pressure is not fully accounted for. Moving on, let's replace this fitting with another. The second fitting is dimensionally identical to the first, but turning vanes have been added. This type of turning vane is known as a single thickness turning vane. By adding the turning vanes, you can see that we have reduced the pressure drop to 0.08, a reduction in pressure loss of 75%. Looking at our flow visualization, the airflow through the fitting is much more uniform with less turbulence, resulting in a lower pressure loss and greater airflow. The first cost of this fitting is roughly $15 more than the elbow without vanes, but the energy savings goes on for the operating life of the system. Here, we can see that the additional cost of the vanes are worth the added expense, with a payback of less than two years. The next fitting we will evaluate is called a short radius elbow. A short radius elbow has a centerline radius approximately equal to the duct dimension in the same plane. Our duct is 9 inches by 13 inches, so the centerline radius of this elbow is also 13 inches. 
As you can see, the pressure drop is very low, with an airflow just 30 CFM short of our baseline setup. We see very little turbulence in the fitting, reinforcing the result. Short radius elbows are compact, yet have minimal pressure loss. This elbow is also less costly than a square elbow with turning vanes. In this case, 22% less expensive. The third fitting is a short radius elbow with a square 90 degree throat. It takes up the same space as the short radius elbow, but is cheaper to make. When comparing the two fittings, we can see that the square throat reduces the cross-sectional area at the middle of the fitting by nearly 20% and creates an abrupt transition that the air has to navigate. As we can see from the flow visualization, the air gets squeezed down through the throat and moves along the heel of the elbow with the air just downstream of the throat recirculating. This contraction and turbulence results in five times the pressure loss when compared to the short radius elbow, with an airflow reduction of 135 CFM, or 9%. The next fitting is a short radius elbow with a mitered throat. The reduction in cross-sectional area is just under 6% when compared with the true short radius elbow. This minor reduction does still create a small eddy just after the throat with otherwise smooth flow. The flow is much better than the radius elbow with square throat, and only 30 CFM less than the short radius elbow. Now we move on to a fitting that we have all been told is the ideal from a performance standpoint, the long radius elbow. As we can see, the throat of the elbow is smooth, and the arc of the throat is a much larger radius than the short radius elbow. Visualizing the flow, we see a very smooth flow throughout the fitting. Not surprisingly, the pressure loss for this fitting is virtually zero. So why not use a long radius elbow everywhere? Sometimes there is simply not enough space. This fitting takes up to 68% more real estate than the other elbows we have seen. It also costs somewhat more. From an energy use standard, it is the ideal, but the space required may be prohibitive. What if you don't have the space for a long radius elbow, but like the performance? Take a short radius elbow and put a splitter at a third the width of the duct from the throat. Looking closely at the geometry, we now essentially have two long radius elbows. The performance is nearly as good as the large radius elbow, taking up much less space. Having thoroughly explored elbow fittings, let's take a look at what are commonly known as T-fittings. Our first fitting is often referred to as a bullhead T. Each downstream branch is sized to handle half of the airflow entering the fitting. Many of us have been told to avoid the bullhead T at all costs. The data shows this may not always be true. The pressure loss of the fitting is not terrible. Looking closer, we find that a small dam of air formed where the airflow splits, guiding the air to each branch. As we saw with the square elbow before, we are getting turbulence after the turn, contributing to the loss. Next, we have taken the bullhead T and mitered the throat of the fitting. This opens up the throat area, providing more room for a smooth flow in each direction and minimizing the turbulence downstream. The pressure drop is similar to the square elbow with turning vanes or short radius elbow. A common fitting in duct systems is a high efficiency takeoff. This is often used to attach a round flex duct to a rectangular duct. The pressure loss of the fitting itself is seen to be a 0.15. When we add a typical 5-foot length of flex duct, however, the pressure loss increases to 0 0.30, double the loss of the fitting alone. We can see that the flex is straight, which is rarely the case. Flex duct is generally used to make it easy to connect to a diffuser. In the most severe case, this could mean a 180-degree bend. As you can see, the pressure loss may increase dramatically. Here we see a surprising 0.6. This demonstrates the importance of properly applying flex duct, keeping lengths as short as possible, velocities low, and bends gradual. This table of fitting is shown as a template for you to make your own comparisons. Cost of fabrication and electricity can vary from location to location. Summarizing, we have demonstrated the varying effect that different types of fittings can have on fan and system performance. Fitting selection should not be left to chance. The selection of fittings should balance first cost against pressure loss and physical space constraints. In part two of this series, we'll be looking at the inlet side of the fan 
and how different duct configurations affect fan performance. We will also demonstrate system effect and its associated consequences. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to our channel and watch for more videos. Are you guys making many new videos? Yeah, yeah we are. Um, here's part two. A lot of emphasis is placed on the proper selection of fans and the amount of energy fans consume. System design and the fan system interface can have a dramatic effect on fan energy consumption. In this video, we will look at the effect duct design has on fan operation through differences in pressure loss. We will also touch on the subject of system effect as it relates to the fan system interface. To illustrate, we are utilizing a single wide, single inlet, light duty blower often referred to as a utility set or vent set. The fan has a non-ducted inlet and length of duct connected to the discharge, a common setup in fan testing. Our duct is the same size as the fan discharge and is 48 inches long. How important is the length of the discharge duct? Let's take a closer look. Am Hang on. Yeah, this is part two. When we put the box and tap to Welcome back to part two of ducted fan performance. In this video, we will explore the inlet side of the fan and how different duct configurations affect fan performance. We will also demonstrate system effect and its associated consequences. As a reminder, the base performance of the fan is 1500 CFM with no static pressure. Okay, let's begin. Let's add a straight length of round pipe to the inlet. The effect on the fan is actually positive. The fan is moving roughly 3% more air than with a free inlet. The inlet duct is 16 inches in diameter, giving a duct velocity of approximately 1,070 feet per minute. At higher velocities, entry losses might give a different result. Now, we'll add a long radius round elbow onto the duct. This is a smack nut recommended detail to move air from inside a building to a roof mounted fan. With this elbow and duct, we are back to where we started as far as fan performance. Often, there is not enough room on the roof for this type of installation. Instead, you may see another type of fitting called a box and tap fitting. After replacing the long radius elbow with this fitting, we see the pressure loss is about one tenth of an inch water gauge. Not bad at this low velocity. It should be noted that the box is 19 inches by nine and one half inches. The ratio of these two dimensions is referred to as aspect ratio. The aspect ratio of this fitting is two to one. The closer the ratio is to one to one, the better. The larger the aspect ratio, the more pinched the entrance to the round duct will be, and more dramatic the pressure loss of the fitting. When space is really tight, you will see the box and tap fitting mounted directly on the fan inlet. Simply moving the fitting 30 inches closer to the fan, we have increased the pressure loss of the fitting from 0.1 to 0.5 inches water gauge. You have heard of the term system effect. This is a great example. Simply moving the fitting closer to the fan has dramatically increased the pressure loss and dropped the airflow 20%. To what do we attribute this difference? Looking at the airflow differences, we can see the answer. With the 30 inch duct guiding the airflow into the fan, we can see the airflow is straight and smooth. When we put the box and tap directly on the fan, however, we see something completely different. We see rotating vortices spinning the air into the inlet. The airflow pattern is constantly dancing around with the vortex moving up and down, side to side, changing rotation, and even forming two counter-rotating vortices. This ever-changing airflow can be heard as pulsating, thrumming, or surging sound. Listen to the sound as the airflow enters the fan.
we can also see the pressure loss swinging wildly with the changing airflow patterns. When the airflow is spinning in the direction of the fan rotation, the pressure drops, and when it is rotating opposite the fan, the pressure rises. Surging, unstable airflow with a wildly varying pressure is not ideal. So what can we do to fix the problem? To address this common concern, Cook designed a fitting that takes up the same space as the box and tap fitting, but without the problems. We call this our no loss inlet fitting. Instead of up to one half inch of pressure loss for the box and tap fitting, this fitting has essentially no pressure loss and stabilizes the airflow. This fitting can be made to orient in many different directions and in a wide array of sizes as the application demands and can be incorporated into a curb cap mount to minimize the number of roof openings. Summarizing, we have demonstrated the varying effect that different types of fittings can have on fan and system performance. Fitting selection should not be left to chance. The selection of fittings should balance first cost against pressure loss and physical space constraints. Pay particular attention when in close proximity to the fan as the effect of a fitting can be amplified dramatically and can cause unstable fan performance. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to our channel and watch for more videos. If you have suggestions about any subjects you would like to see covered, send them to marketing at laurencook.com. All right, so that concludes this portion. I know we're a little bit earlier than we planned, but that's the difference between running a video and that type of thing. The system effect, we can go into a lot more detail, but seeing it actually in person in conjunction with some of the slides and the in-depth um, on that makes the world a difference on that. But in summary, the rotation and discharge and the space allotments are critical for the performance of the fan. I cannot stress that enough. And I've given you hopefully a few things that you can see right off the bat of where to go back to reference that. Also go back to the ASHRAE fan chapter and of course the AMCA um, publication that's already noted on that. Right. Thank you, Tom's got a few more things to wrap this up. We'll go from there. Well, first of all, for the people over here, how about a nice hand for Fred? Great job. Um, we do have a few minutes for Q&A, so we're monitoring. So if you do have any Q&A questions, Dan, I think we answered your question on the last one. Um, but um, I don't think the video showed it, but a long radius elbow into a fan isn't awful. Um, that right. question was, you know, if you're, if you can't get three duct diameters in advance of the inlet, you know, how bad is that? A long radius elbow into the inlet isn't, it's, what is it, one or two percent? Yeah. It's pretty small potatoes. Um, if, uh, dear contractors, if you're ever in a situation where you're not achieving the inlet or discharge, recommended inlet or discharge con uh, configurations on a fan, please send it to someone at Airflow. We, there's lots of different ways to skin a cat when it comes to fan configurations. And we may have an idea that you hadn't considered that inlet box doesn't need to be in a certain configuration. Um, but a lot of times you can change in uh, a square inline fan to an elbow fan. You can put an inlet box on a utility set. You can switch a, a mixed flow fan from arrangement nine to arrangement three and shorten it up. So stuff that you're not gonna be as familiar with, we may have a kick at the can. Um, so just some ideas for contractors uh, when you're, of course, you always have all the space you need, I know. Um, do we have any questions? And if not, we're gonna wrap up a little bit early. So everybody who's in the audience, thanks for attending. Uh, sometime next week or early the following, you'll receive your PDH certificates via email. You will see, receive a link to this class um i think there might be uh, we'll probably put a link to uh cook's youtube channel if you want to check out the other videos and anything else we think of along the way we'll send it to you um and then well for those of you who uh, if you know someone who uh, didn't get to watch the the training seminars we are going to post it and there will be quizzes so you can take your pdh challenge 
um, sometime in the future. So that is a wrap for any questions. I don't think so. I don't see any. So that's a wrap for all of us at Airflow. Stay uh, out of the snow if you can. And Brent, have a safe drive home. Thanks. And thanks everybody for coming.